Welcome everyone to this, our final STED talk here at St. Edwards, and we um, have the home team on hand today. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, my recent book on uh, Leviticus, A Journey Through the World of Leviticus, Holiness, Sacrifice, and the Rock Badger, which you uh, can purchase one if you would like after the, um, after the, the talk this evening. And then we also afterwards, as always, uh, and I will introduce you to the wines that we have for this evening, but I'll, I'll save that for a little bit later. So tonight, um, the way it will work, so I'll begin um, and talk a little bit about, um, about what uh, is Leviticus, uh, why it's so important to us, and, and why I kind of wrote the book. And then afterwards, um, Matthias uh, is going to come up. And then he is going to talk a little bit more about uh, atonement and atonement theory, how theologians have approached this, especially Karl Barth, um, which is what he did his doctoral dissertation on. So we thought there was a good combination uh, for both of us to, um, to, to give a little chat tonight. And, uh, and his, uh, a copy of his um, dissertation will be, uh, will be on sale as well. So you can come uh, join us over uh, afterwards. So... Tonight is a, uh, it is going to be a little bit of a journey as the, as the title of the book uh, expresses, because I think to understand the book of Leviticus, this often loathed, often uh, dismissed book of the Old Testament met by Christians and Jews alike, actually, is, is fundamentally missing causing us to miss something about the depth of the sacred world that Leviticus depicts for us. And so I just want to talk through a little bit tonight about why it's so important to read Leviticus. And this is all in the book, and it goes into more depth, obviously. Um, but what it can teach us as Christians today, because I think all of Scripture... Uh, speaks to us. All of Scripture can inform us. And even though we know in the New Testament, uh, Jesus kind of abolishes things like the food laws, and you know, Paul goes into this in his letters to the Corinthians, there is still so much that we have to learn from uh, this remarkable book. Uh, one of the reasons it's so difficult, and one of the reasons we have to kind of go on a journey to get into the book of Leviticus is because we're talking about how God was teaching his people in an ancient agrarian society in the Middle East who were predominantly illiterate. So the question is, is, is how do you teach someone about holiness? How do you teach people about the, the great doctrines and understandings of God when they can't pick up books and read, where they don't have access to universities or the university library? How do, you, how do you convey who this gracious and merciful and holy God is? Well, that's what we're going to look at this evening and what we're going to discuss as we think about what Leviticus is, uh, is trying to do and, and what it does in the scripture. Now, <clears throat> the great poet William Blake once wrote, for everything that lives is holy. And I thought this was a beautiful summary uh, by Blake of the worldview in which we enter into when we enter into Leviticus. All of the world is holy. All of the world is consecrated to God. All things are holy because they are God's. Now, they're not holy in, in, a, in some type of pantheistic way. It is not that God is you know, physically present in you know, the, the, the pigeon outside or the tree or whatever it is. But there is a sense in Leviticus that his holiness, his imminence, his power, his life, his breath, all of which God uses to bring forth creation out of nothing and keeps it in uh, in its form, or keeps it, um, kind of sustains it, and, and, uh, and brings life out of it, and fertility. This is what Leviticus sees as holy, that all the world is holy. And Leviticus, when we remember 
that it is follows the Exodus. So the Israelites have been left uh, Egypt. They've been delivered out of Egypt by God's hand. They've gone to Mount Sinai. They've received the law. And then Leviticus now sits in this place where they build the tabernacle at the end of Exodus, which is God's tent, his home. It is where God is going to live, to dwell in his, in his localized presence. But the question then becomes, how can we as human beings, as, as unclean, sinful people, live in the presence of a holy God? And this is the answer. This is the question that Leviticus is trying to answer. But one of the reasons why I think it's so difficult for us to enter into this this world of holiness, enter into this sacred world that is uh, filled with God's presence, his localized presence in the tabernacle, that, that powerhouse of his glory, but then his glory kind of emanating out of the tabernacle into the world. But one of the reasons I think it's so difficult for us to understand this is because we live in a world that is desacralized. We live in a world and in a society that has stripped holiness from how we perceive the world around us. Now, scholars have different, different words for this or different terms for this. One of them is desacralization, kind of stripping out the holy from the world. Another one is disenchantment, um, if you're uh, into kind of more fantasy. <laughs> that's, Peter likes that word. Um, if... The idea of disenchantment is, is that there is, the world is, becomes, and this is what has happened in our culture today, because the world is not holy, because it is not sacred, when it is stripped of these things, it just becomes material, right? The, the tree is just a tree only in so far as I can cut it down and make something of it or use it for wood for my fire. And so what happens is that the framework of all creation, when it's stripped of holiness, when it's stripped of sacredness, we, our society treats it in, in utilitarian terms because things are not used so much or things are not treated so much as 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 objects that require our, our awe, our wonder that God has made these things, that God is somehow present in his creation. Um, and so it becomes a material. It becomes something for economic use. It becomes something that we simply take and that we consume and we think really nothing else of it. So whether it's a cow or a chicken or a tree, a river, or even a human being, the moment that we strip the world of holiness and sacredness is the moment that we turn everything or reduce everything into a commodity to be used. And we've seen this all around us, modern day slavery that continues to occur in our world. This is what happens when the world is desacralized. It's concerned with consumption, fulfillment, uh, economic prosperity, individuality at the expense of community, because there is nothing sacred around us. And consequently, I think one of the other consequences of this is that part of also how our society approaches things is that, is that with this kind of scientific empirical approach to the material world. We can examine something and once we determine how it functions or how it works, then we say there are no, then we've explained away God. So if I can tell you how a plant goes through the process of photosynthesis, if I can tell you how it takes carbon from the atmosphere and produces energy, releases it through its roots, and how beneath the soil that root structure uh, filled with mycorrhizal fungi and all of these beautiful networks beneath the soil that extend for miles and miles communicating with one another through sound or vibration, feeding plants and all of these different things, the wonders of which we are just still scratching the surface of. I'm sad that Josiah is not here because he could talk to you about it in more depth. Um, 
But all of these things, we only even, even are getting a glimpse of understanding. The moment that we explain them, we say, ah, there is no need for God. But Leviticus offers us a different world. It's a world in which the world and all of the things in it are holy. God is sacred. He is present in his world. And thus, Israel, his people, have a particular place within that world that they have to treat the world as it is a sacred gift, a gift to be honored, a gift that is to be treated with care and consideration, that people, because people are sacred, because people are made in the image of God and bear his likeness, that there is uh, an, ex an incredible emphasis on justice and mercy in Leviticus, especially, especially when we get to Leviticus chapter 19 and onward. And this is where the famous love your neighbor as yourself commandment comes from, as Jesus says, is the second great commandment. And so when we begin to look through the lens of Leviticus, and as I kind of entered into this world myself as I was writing this book, and as I was working on Leviticus, I began to recognize how influenced I am by our culture and how influenced I am by treating the world around me as something that is not sacred. And it's been a fascinating journey on my, in my own experience to begin to, to think and see through this lens of God's presence in his creation, that all things are holy and he is calling us into that holiness. And this is, leads us to another aspect of the book of Leviticus that is incredibly difficult for us modern, enlightened, 21st century kind of Christians. And that is that the way that Leviticus teaches about holiness is through ritual. Rituals are at the core of how Leviticus offers a way to help us understand God's holiness, help us understand our sinfulness, help us understand the value of our neighbor, the value of our farm animals, the value of the land. All of these things are instilled in Israel through ritual. And rituals um, are things that we don't, really, we don't really think much about rituals in our kind of contemporary world. And I think there's a, there's a reason why. We do have rituals. I mean, most of you, well, some of you maybe, you wake up in the morning. Does anybody have a coffee ritual in the morning? I mean, I'm certainly one of them. Or a tea ritual. So you, maybe you wake up, first thing you do is, a per, you know, you have a little ritual for breakfast as you, you know, set your coffee or tea out and you eat. And we have rituals before we go to bed. You know, we brush our teeth and we do wash our face or whatever it is we do. And all of these kind of embodied actions speak to what we believe as human beings. So if I go around washing my hands constantly throughout the day, I have a ritual of washing my hands that expresses probably a deep belief or maybe an anxiety or neuroses, whatever we want to call it, you know, that my hands always need to be clean. Okay, if I brush my teeth at night, I'm expressing, I do a ritual, I perform a ritual that expresses the idea that I think it's good to have clean teeth so that they don't rot in my mouth. Whatever it is, we have all of these different rituals that help not only help form who we are as human beings, but they help form how we think and how we respond. Now, I'm going to date myself completely, but how many of you remember the, um, the movie, uh, the film Karate Kid? Do you remember young daniel son? Yes, yeah, so you remember young Daniel and Mr. Miyagi. And do you remember he wants to train and he wants to learn karate, and what does Mr. Miyagi do? He says, he says I want you to go and wax my car. And he, says, and he says, oh, okay. And he goes out and sees that Mr. Miyagi has about 50 cars. And, and he says, you know, and he, so he teaches him. He said, so when you, you know, you wax on and you wax off. You know, you wax on and you wax off. And so, of course, Daniel goes out and he does all of these cars and does this and thinks, you know, this is useless. What am I doing? You know, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. You know, and then, you know, Mr. Miyagi says, oh, you know, throw a punch at me. And he does a wax on and wax off. And then all of a sudden, 
Daniel has the technique embodied in his, you know, in his muscles and in his memory. And so when he goes into a fight or whatever it is, he immediately knows. And this is, this is what ritual does to us. It helps us to think. It helps us to understand when our bodies are involved. Um, and so we get into these rituals, and they, they bring a sense of... And, and there's so many different... We can't talk about all the rituals in uh, Leviticus this evening, but there are so many rituals around sacrifice uh, that uh, Matthias will touch on a little bit later. There are rituals around time. So Leviticus offers a full calendar year of liturgical time. The rituals of celebrating seasons and, and festivals throughout the year. Um, but there are rituals are uh, there are rituals about how we how we wash and clean ourselves, how we, again, how we offer sacrifices. And all of these different things help to situate ourselves in the world. So ritual, rituals have a, a kind of stabilizing power to them. They help us understand who we are, but also who we are in the kind of scope of time and in the scope of creation. Uh, I was reading, um, this is a, a continental philosopher. Um, he grew up in Germany, but he is a, a Korean heritage. And his name is um, Byun, Byun Hul Han. Um, and he wrote a book called The Disappearance of Ritual. And uh, there was this wonderful quote that, he, that, he, that I just wanted to read to you. He says, uh, and, and the whole book is, I mean, there's this wonderful, it's a very short reflection. I mean, I highly recommend it. It's a, it's a really lovely book, but it's, um, but it's, uh, it's all about how we have lost our sense of place and lost our sense of, of location and identity in time because we are becoming a culture without rituals. I mean, he says this, and I quote, <clears throat> we can define rituals as symbolic techniques of making oneself at home in the world. They transform being in the world <clears throat> into being at home. They turn the world into a reliable place. They are to time what a home is to space. They render time inhabitable. And I love that idea of rendering time habitable, that we can, we can habitate, we can dwell in this world when we root ourselves in these rituals year after year, ritual time and different, uh, different types of rituals. And so the difficulty that he goes on to, to argue in his book and the difficulty that he talks about is that, is that one of the things that has in some ways destroyed the consistency and the continuity of ritual is the advent of digital technologies. And he talks about this, that life <clears throat> in the digital world is, is, is again reduced to this individual consumption. Um, and that there is, uh, he talks a lot about the narcissism of our age, that, that for many people, the, uh, the internet, these you know, phones that we use, all of these things, social media, are kind of pushing us further and further towards narcissism, narcissism that is, again, just concerned with consumption. How can I consume more? How can I have people consume my social media? I have 50,000 followers or whatever it is. Uh, it becomes just about me. And at the rate digital technologies are changing and uh, and at the and there's there's tons of books on this I talk about this a little bit in the book um, but at the rate that these um, these platforms are in are deliberately addicting us are deliberately trying to get us addicted to these um, to these technologies uh, we get pushed further and further into isolation we get pushed further and further into a world where we sit singularly behind our screens, addicted to them, but also losing that human reality and connection that we share through rituals, through things we do with our bodies. <clears throat> our culture, I think, hates the idea of taking a moment in time 
and thinking clearly, processing something, reflecting on something. Everything around us screams distraction. You know, don't, don't stop, don't think, just buy the next thing, do this, do that, continue to consume, to the point where, <clears throat> I don't know if you've seen this in marketing in your, wherever you kind of come across marketing, whether it's on your phones or on the news or on the radio or whatever it is, um, even to the point where consumption has been, <laughs> has been twisted into an ethical action. So, for example, buy this cup because you will save the world. Or eat this food because you are going to save something. So all of a sudden, consumption becomes justified by the new thing because you're going to do something good out of it. And this is the world we live in. Ah, again, it's a, this, it's a desacralized world. Where material, where the world is just, uh, the world around us is just material that has no meaning, has no purpose. And this is where I think, and what I've discovered, <clears throat> where I think Leviticus is so, is so powerful in pulling us back to say, actually, you live in a world that is inhabited by God, that God fills this world with holiness. And the key verse, or one of the key verses in Leviticus is chapter 19, verse 2, where God says to all of the Israelites, be holy, therefore, as the Lord your God is holy. So it's not just that holiness is out there and it's of God. God calls us to holiness ourselves so that we can be present with him. There are so many rituals in Leviticus, but I did want to just mention one, and then uh, in, a, in a couple of minutes, I'll pass it over to, um, to Matthias. But the one that struck me, and I loved writing this chapter, um, was, was rituals designed around eating. Now, how can eating make someone holy? How does that help us on our journey to holiness? And how does not eating a little rock badger or a hyrax, as they're called, this little ancient fluffy, uh, <laughs> fluffy, fluffy creature uh, that dons the cover of the book, um, what is it about the rock badger that's so special that if I ate one, I would somehow <laughs> become unholy? Well, thankfully, we don't have this rules, these rules anymore um, in the Christian age, but I, I'm not sure that you would want to eat rock badger anyway. I'm not sure that it tastes very good, like a gopher or something like that. Anyway, so let's pause for a moment. We're going to look at this chapter in Leviticus that I think is so fascinating. It's Leviticus chapter 11. And basically what it does is it lists out all of the foods and the animals that Israel can eat and those that they are not supposed to eat, those that are permitted and those are, um, that are um, not permitted. And so... When we think about it, this, this seems you know, rather mundane, doesn't it? You know, why, why is God telling his people about what to eat? And again, what does this have anything? How does this have anything to do with holiness? Well, different scholars and different rabbis have, have kind of pondered the, the, the um, what we call the, um, basically the Jews who, who live by this today are the kosher laws, kosher eating laws. Kashrut is what it's called in, uh, in Hebrew. Um, and so, They've pondered about why God would say, you know, you can eat this animal, but don't eat this animal. And it goes into all the ones that, you know, if they chew the cud and they have a split hoof and, you know, or a split, split foot, toe and, and, and you can eat those, but not these other ones. <clears throat> anyway, probably the most convincing argument that I found was, was one about animals of prey, um, that we weren't meant to eat animals of prey or that were preyed upon because that was a symbolic um, way of, of, of kind of not being aggressive towards another person. Now, that's just one, one response. Other people have tried different, um, different ways to figure out how, you know, why you can eat these things and, and why you can't eat other things. But the point of the, uh, these dietary laws is, I think, absolutely fascinating. Because here is one of the most kind of simple mundane things we do in life every single day, you know, unless we're fasting. We wake up, we have breakfast, we have lunch, we have dinner. And what better way to teach someone 
through day in, day out, through their day in, day out life and experience than by attaching meaning to what we put in our mouths and in our bodies. This is an ancient agrarian society. Uh, they had very little in the way of, of food to sustain them. Um, you know, if they, uh, if they were shepherds or semi-nomadic, then they would just have from, mostly from their flocks and milk. Um, but when Israel was in the land, they obviously had things like grains and olive oil and wine and things like that. But the idea is, is that every time as an ancient Israelite, you sit down at table, every time you break bread, or have some olives. It would be on a rare occasion that you would have meat anyway, but let's say you have some meat. You are reminded that these are the foods from God's creation that you are allowed to eat. So all of a sudden, that shifts your entire worldview, doesn't it? Because you're saying that I am part of a covenant people and this covenant people is bound by what God says. And so when I eat, I'm identifying myself as a son or a daughter of the covenant of God. And not like, you know, who else and everybody else who's eating, you know, eating their different foods. But the other thing that it does is that it takes what is fundamental to us as human beings, which are our appetites, and it curbs them in such a way to remind us that we are part of God's creation, that we don't have free access to anything we want, we cannot eat anything we want, we cannot treat anything we want as if it's something that is ours to be consumed. And again, that puts us back into this place of humility before God. And what better way to do that than to remind someone every day, every time you put something in your mouth, whether you have to think about whether it is clean or whether it is unclean, and you think about it as a holy gift from God. And so the food laws, I mean, I think are the most ingenious thing that the Bible has ever, well, that God ever came up with. <laughs> because think about how many Jews over 3,000 years later are still obedient to the very same laws. And I guarantee if you speak to a Jew who follows kosher laws, they will tell you how critical it is to their life and their identity. Why? Because eating is something that we have to do. But it's something when we, when we put it in the context of our relationship with God, our relationship with creation, we all of a sudden find ourselves not as the, you know, the ultimate narcissistic consumer that our society tells us to become, but we find ourselves as part of a broader and greater ecosystem and network of life that God has created. And so I think it's just a fascinating, it's a fascinating thing when you take such a simple and mundane act as eating, turn it into a ritual, and all of a sudden it becomes this incredible tool for learning and for teaching and for, uh, for conveying to people who God is as holy and who we are as his people. There are so many more examples, other examples that I could go into. Um, the book talks about sacred time, um, food laws. Uh, it talks about the tabernacle, the ho God's holy space, and why we need to be holy to approach that space, all of these different things. Um, so it really tries to give a, a reading of the, the, the text, but then also a real a kind of a Christian a Christian approach to it and say, what, what can we do with these things? Because obviously we know as we come into the Christian and the New Testament, um, you know, the sacrificial laws and things like that um, are completed by the sacrifice of Christ, this once for all sacrifice. But it doesn't mean that we can just discard what has gone before. And I think there's such a richness and so much that we can learn um, from, this, uh, from this wonderful book of the Bible that often gets, 
uh, it gets a very bad press. Um, and I, I don't really blame it. I mean, it is fairly boring to read through sometimes when you read through seven chapters of, you know, cut the animal this way and do this and do this and do this. Um, it's not the most exciting. But I think when we press ourselves a little bit into its world and this ancient kind of agrarian world and again and recognize the world that we're surrounded by you know and and what what our world teaches us and tells us then i think we begin to understand uh, what is at the root of of christ's call for us to be holy and um and to be unblemished and how that holiness is is so wrapped up in our rituals, our daily lives, how we treat creation as a sacred place, not as a commodity, all of these types of things. So the other ritual uh, that is, is in Leviticus is, is sacrifice and is this idea of atonement, this idea that, that the blood of an animal washes away or cleanses us so that we can be in relationship with God. And this is something that is, uh, requires much, much longer to talk about, but I'm going to let Matthias talk about it now. Um, but it is a, uh, a fascinating topic that theologians have wrestled with um, because obviously it makes, uh, has so much, uh, uh, such a critical, um, uh, critical importance to our understanding of what Christ has done for us in his atonement. Um, but so I'm going to let Matthias come up, and, um, and he's going to talk to us a bit about his PhD work. And, some, and, and just, to, just to point out, there's actually two. Um, we've started uh, this St. Edward's Institute uh, online journal, and um, I've got an article there on uh, Leviticus and humility and our, uh, and uh, what was the other, what was it, Leviticus, humility, and what was that? Limitlessness, yes, <laughs> that's right, that's right. Limitlessness, and then uh, and Matthias has one on atonement. So do um, do go online and, and have a read of those. But let me pass it on to Matthias, and um, he'll go for some time, and then we'll um, and then we'll just have some uh, time for questions and answers, and then we'll uh, break and adjourn to to our wine and food. All right, Matthias. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Um, as Mark said, my PhD was on Bart, uh, and I looked at his doctrine of election and atonement and the Holy Spirit. In fact, I wrote the PhD whilst uh, Mark and I were um, sharing a study at training college, and when I came to these exegetical bits, um, we had a lot of discussion about them. So what, what I did in the PhD is I looked at Bart's small print in his church dogmatics, especially the exegetical sections. And as Mark mentioned, uh, they are about holiness, about ritual, how they help us to think and how we respond uh, to them. So this short paper, and it will be short, will look at Bart's doctrine of election and it will show how systematic theology actually makes use of exegesis, in particular the often forgotten book of Leviticus. So let's start. Carbart's doctrine of election represents a new turn in Bart's theology, in which he is most conscious of being original and therefore must go to great length to support his position by scripture. Bart claims to be a scriptural theologian. So in Church Pragmatic 2.2, in paragraph 35, the election of the individual, Bart argues that Jesus Christ is both the elect as well as the rejected. It is in this section that we unearth the most important exegesis of biblical narratives in the volume. What Bart does here is he presents three excursuses, one on Leviticus 16 and 14, uh, a second one on Saul and David, and a final one on 1 Kings 13. And he argues that these are part of a line of argument that highlights the biblical pattern of the two sides of election, the elect and the reprobate, uh, starting with Cain and Abel. And in all these biblical narratives, Bart sees two lines running through the biblical history uh, with the elect and the rejected being complementary in a binary structure until finally they meet in one person, Jesus Christ. So our focus this evening, as you might have assumed, is on the first excursus, on the cultic texts 
of purification ritual of Leviticus 14 and 16 to make the connection to Mark's book on Leviticus and also to show how relevant uh, the book of Leviticus is to systematic theology. Uh, another theologian that works with Leviticus very closely is Catherine Sondag, if you're interested. So Bart looks at these two rituals found in Leviticus in 14, chapter 14 and 16. The first is the ceremony of the cleansing of a leper in Leviticus 14, 4 to 7. The second is the ritual of the great day of atonement, Yom Kippur, in Leviticus 16, 5 following. In the first ritual, two living birds are brought to the, high, to the priest together with cedar wood, scarlet yarn and hyssop for the one to be cleansed, for the person to be cleansed. One bird is killed over fresh water and its blood is caught in a clay pot. The priest then takes the second bird, which is still alive, and dips it together with the cedar wood, scarlet yarn and hyssop into the blood of the first bird that was killed over fresh water. The person who is to be cleansed from leprosy is sprinkled seven times with the blood and the priest announces the person clean. Finally, the second bird, which was dipped alive into the blood of the first, is then released to fly away into the open field. In the second ritual, Leviticus 16, the high priest presents two live goats uh, to, uh, in front of the entrance of the tent of meeting. Representing, so he presents two goats to the Lord. The priest then draws lots for the two goats, one for the Lord and the other for Azazel. And after offering a bull for his own sins and sprinkling its blood on the atonement cover, the priest then offers the first goat upon which the, the Lord's uh, lot fell for the purification offering for the people. And he takes the blood into the Holy of Holies. He sprink, sprinkles it in front of the hilasterion, or rather on the, on the hilasterion, the kaporet, which is called the lit, uh, which is the lit of the Ark of the Covenant. And after making atonement at the altar and the Holy of Holies, he takes the second goat and confesses over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites. So if you want, the sins are put on the head of the goat, which is then sent away into the desert, to the realm of Azazel. Uh, Mark talked about the realm of holiness. There's also the other realm, the, the realm of chaos, the realm of Azazel. In some Jewish traditions, Azazel is seen as a, either a rocky place or a, a name for a desert demon. In any way... The, 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 the goat then carries away all the sins of the Israelites into the desert. And according to the Jewish tradition, the goat was normally pushed over the edge of a cliff to ensure that it wouldn't come back into the camp and contaminate the community. So for Bart, there is a unifying significance of Leviticus 14 and 16, which is the common form of both rituals that each time two animals, identical in species and value, undergo completely different treatments. Bart argues that we see in these rituals the divine divisive choice of this one and not that one. And this divine decision, Bart explains, is an example of the elective principle running through the entire Old Testament, which reminds us of the Genesis narratives of Cain and Abel, um, Isaac and Ishmael, Jacob and Esau, uh, which he says then par parallel the rituals in Leviticus. And furthermore, both ceremonies attest to a purification. In Leviticus, the priest confirms that the person is cured from leprosy, and in Leviticus 16, the high priest verifies the removal of sin from the entire nation. It's the great day of atonement. So Bart says that in the ritual of Leviticus 16, so looking now uh, more specifically at uh, the two rituals, first 16, then 14, Bart says then that in 
chapter 16, Israel should see it is God who is dealing with her impurities. And she is invited to recognize herself in the first goat as the chosen nation elected by and for God and not for Azazel. What the second goat represents is not a freeing of the animal into liberty, but rather a chasing away into the realm of Azazel. What the treatment of the second goat symbolizes to Israel through the picture is a proclamation that the place where they really belong is in the wilderness, unworthy to do God's service. So the second goat is the image of the non-elect as, as they stand apart from the elect. The embodiment of a human being as she is without divine grace of God. And so it is in this way that the non-elect do not simply testify to their own hopeless existence, but are in fact representatives of all of humanity, her sins and her punishment, a life in the wilderness, away from the community, lacking any chance of purification, any lack of holiness, any lack, uh, lacking any redemptive sacrificial death, and hence a life beyond reconciliation and new life. And then Bart ends this uh, passage on Leviticus 16 with the observation that Cain is just as indispensable as Abel and Ishmael as Isaac. For the grace which makes an elect human of the first can be seen only from the second. Because the first, the elect, must see in the second, the non-elect, as in a mirror that from which he was taken and who and what the God is who has delivered him from it. It is only as, the one who is pro um, it is only as one who properly belongs to that place that God has transferred him from, because election is grace. The unused belongs to the used. The sacrificed goat belongs to the goat driven out into the wilderness. The non-elect to the elect. So you already see a kind of um, connection between elect and non-elect. Moving on to Leviticus 14. Here we see uh, the ceremony of the ritual describes um, that it runs almost, well, not almost, it exactly runs the opposite direction to the ritual in Leviticus 16. The purification based on the divine election is not manifested, Bart writes, in the first bird, which is slain, but rather in the second, which is released. So the question is, what does the second bird mean? And for Bart, the bird undoubtedly signifies the resurrection, God's grace towards Israel. It is a sign of freedom that God bestows as well as uh, of the um, restoration and renewal of life that God brings about. So that bird that is dipped into the blood that, that flies away. According to Bart, death and life cannot be seen in only one picture. They are mirror images and yet also part of one and the same event. The salvific death that is common to both texts can be seen as the axis around which the different aspects of the event rotate. So in Leviticus 16, you have that picture that is looking back from the standpoint of death. Remember the goat that is driven out, that is removed so backward looking to the death of the old life, which is annulled by death. And Leviticus 14, the, the bird that flies away, looks forward uh, from the salvific death towards the new life that has been won. But again, it is one event in one salvific death for Bart, which stands at the center of both. So one event that is portrayed from two different perspectives, backward looking from the old life, and forward looking to, towards the new life. And then Bart, Bart's exegesis in a way hits that impasse um, and he has that question, what is the subject of the Old Testament witnesses? What, what do the birds and the goats represent? And then Bart says, well, we are confronted with a choice here. Either we say, 
the subject of the Old Testament witness may be regarded as an unknown quantity, or, he says, the subject of the Old Testament witness may be accepted as identical with the person of Jesus Christ, as it is seen and interpreted and proclaimed by the apostles, because he had himself revealed and present, uh, represented himself to them in this way. So when he explains to, to the um, disciples on the, the road to Emmaus, when he explains scripture to them, he says, you know, you, you find me in, in these scriptures. That is what Bart means here. So Bart sees Leviticus 14 and 16, along with the other stories that I mentioned, um, Cain and Abel and so forth, as prophecies of and witnesses to Jesus Christ. And Bart argues that many of the church fathers did exactly the same typological um, interpretation of scripture as he does, looking at pictures that appear to point towards Christ and be fulfilled in him. So he sees the two doves and the two goats as types pointing towards Christ. So key, uh, Jesus then becomes the key uh, to unlocking the Old Testament narrative. Coming to my conclusion, and obviously you can't really uh, say much in, in 10, 10, 12 minutes, but we have seen that one of the most interesting and per perceptive features in Bart's doctrine of election, and you have to trust me here, is that he, the way he uses scripture to support his theological systematic reflection. And Bart's exegesis and systematic reflection, they, they are in harmony with each other, and they form a unity. So his hermeneutical circle focuses on these two events, if you want, the yes, this dialectic um, relationship between the yes and the no, if you want, the, the death, symbolized um, as um, by, by the killing of the animal, um, which points towards the crucifixion. So you have the, uh, the no, God's uh, uh, no, and the yes, the resurrection. So there's that tension. Bart's uh, theology is dialectic, um, and it must, be, it must be held together, that, that yes and that no, or that no and that yes. Um, and that becomes really his... Um, his exegetical foundation. So he sees Jesus' crucifixion as the only rejection. So Jesus is the, the single reprobate who has taken that rejection on behalf of us all. And on the other hand, his resurrection shows God's election of humanity. So again, Jesus' death, his death on the cross, is the only rejection for Bart. And the resurrection is the election of all of humanity. And then he sums up, election is thus understood as Christ's suffering rejection on the cross and electing this in order that humanity may be elect even in its rejection of God. It's a bit complicated, but... So Christ's suffering rejection on the cross and electing this in order that humanity may be elect even in its rejection of God. So that's Bart's understanding of election. And as you might, might have guessed, there are a number of questions that remain. I mean, in some way, Bart's, Bart has this innovative um, Old Testament exegesis, but the question is, is it too neat? Can the binary of election and rejection in the biblical narrative, beginning with Cain and Abel, can it be resolved and brought into a synthesis in Jesus Christ as Bart does? Or is Bart in danger of fabricating a biblical system and a hermeneutical method that is not in line with and faithful to the biblical witness? Um, for example, in Leviticus 14, is it correct to say that the purification based on the divine election is not manifested in the first bird? which is slain. So he has that negative aspect, that no, that um, on, 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 on the sacrifice. And with regards to Leviticus 16, 
how can Jesus simultaneously fulfill the role of both goats, uh, the, the, the sin offering that goes into the Holy of Holies, as well as the one that is sent out into the wilderness to the realm of Azazel. So the two animals that serve completely different functions and have different fates. So ultimately, maybe the question is, is it correct to understand the crucifixion uh, or the death, the, uh, the sacrifices in Leviticus as God's rejection? So maybe I want to end here with a cliffhanger. And if you want to know the answers, then you need to buy my book, uh, which you can get for 10 quid and all the, the money will go to the St. Edward's Institute. So maybe I end here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Evening. I, I, you know, these. Matthias was talking about the the um, Leviticus chapter 16 and the Day of Atonement and these two goats and uh, you know one goes off to the wilderness. I mean, and and again, this is all of these symbolic rituals that Israel would have witnessed and seen, and they would have seen a goat. You know, the high priest playing placing two hands on its head and sending it off to the wilderness as a sign of their sin being sent back to the chaos of, of the desert. Um, and, and all of these things, you know, there's just so much richness in them. And, and you know, theologians like Bart and, and, and others have, have explored these in, in so many different ways. Um, so anyway, we'll, 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 we'll pause now for some questions. If anybody, we've got a, um, a microphone going around just for the recording. So if you, if you can um, speak into the microphone, does anybody have any any thoughts? Oh, Hosanna does in the back, and then Steve, we'll go, we'll, we'll go to you. Thank you. Um, I was wondering how we should understand the rituals of cleanliness regarding the bodies of disabled people and women, menstruating women. Um, like how the laws that would, the rituals that would exclude them or bar them from, from God's presence um, should be understood. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. That, that one always seems to come up. <laughs> Women seem to get the short end of the, uh, end of the stick in terms of, um, so <clears throat> two things, I think, uh, in, a, in a simple way to try to explain it simply, is that <clears throat> blood in Leviticus is, is kind of the most, the most sacred symbol of, of life. It's given for atonement. It is, it is kind of the most significant physical symbol in, in the whole you know, worship of ancient Israel. Um, but blood also has kind of a negative association with it. <clears throat> so if you're, so like bleeding from menstruation, um, even bleeding after childbirth, um, which are two cases in Leviticus where a woman is not able to come to, near the tabernacle to make her offerings. Um, because in that sense, blood can be associated with death. And so the idea that, so nothing that is associated with death can kind of come into contact with God because he's holy. And so <clears throat> I think what often gets misinterpreted, and I, and I talk about this in, in the book, um, in, in a chapter on purity, is that sometimes we attribute um, a, a kind of a moral sin or some type of morality to some of the purity laws. But so when I think, I think in Leviticus, when a woman is, is not allowed to go to the tabernacle because she's in her menstrual, you know, menstrual cycle or, her, um, or she's just given birth to either a boy or, or a girl, um, I don't think it's, it's not saying anything about the woman and her you know, sinfulness by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, the Christian church later kind of interprets it to a certain extent in that way. Um, but that had to do with some of Augustine's hang-ups on sex and <laughs> all sorts of stuff like that. I think I do go into that in the book somewhere. Anyway, um, but, but I think that the, the key to understanding in, in Leviticus is just this idea of to approach God's holiness I mean, really for our own sake, you know, for our own lives and for the preservation of our own lives, we have to be in a state of some purity. And, and when blood is spilled or when blood is kind of goes out, uh, in, in term, you know, whether it's a childbirth or the woman's menstrual cycle, there is something about that in this ancient mindset that makes 
a woman unclean. It doesn't make her immoral. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love a woman any less because, you know, I mean, it wouldn't make any sense because, you know, the command of Genesis, you know, chapter one is to be fruitful and multiply. You know, and this is part of the woman's role in the world is, is being able to give birth to children and do all these things. So I don't think it's, I don't think it's a question of, of Leviticus kind of condemning a woman, um, you know, or her morality. It's just saying you're in a state of uncleanness for this particular time. <clears throat> After that, you can go and, and offer sacrifices. And similar for men, you know, men could, you know, if you touched a dead thing, you know, then you were unclean for a day. If you did other th types of things, then you would be unclean and you'd have to go through washings and whatnot. But, um, but again, I think the purity laws, sometimes we have to separate them from you know, a kind of a moral sin, if that, if that makes any sense. Does that, does that help? Is that <laughs> I think Paul was curious about, you know, bodies, disabled bodies, bodies with defects. Oh, Why yes. Oh, they... and disabil disability as well. Yeah. I mean, I think, again, I don't have as, as good an answer for that one in the sense of, I think, you know, in that kind of ancient mindset, <clears throat> anything that was considered to have a blemish, so whether you had a skin disease whether you were disabled in some way, um, you know, that was, yeah, it was just, it was a bit of taboo to be, you know, to draw near to God's holiness. Again, I don't think, though I can see the implications on a person who maybe does have a physical handicap, but I don't think Leviticus is trying to be exclusionary in the sense of out of kind of a demoralizing of that person but it's more concerned about preserving the holiness of God's tabernacle. So yeah, but that, but that, that, that it is a difficult one. But yeah, um, Steve. Thank you. Um, well, that was very interesting. Uh, I guess this is for, uh, for you, Mark. Um, I, I thought it was, it, was, uh, it was fascinating how you described uh, this process of our world becoming less um, ritualistic and less sacralized. And I was curious how um, you would respond to the, the critique that modernism itself is a, is a kind of sacralization. Um, so if you think about like, uh, the way, like sort of environment, environmental movement or even the way we, we you know, because we, we have our own like eating habits and things. So, in terms of gluten-free and all this, and, and not, I'm not trying to say anything about the merits of all this, but just the way that we could potentially see modernism as a form of sacralization, mm. a, a rival form rather than an absence of the sacred. So I was curious how you think Leviticus would comment on that or if it, um, how it, how it treats rival forms of, of uh, ritual and, sa and sacredness. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's, <clears throat> I mean, I think that's a fascinating question and, and um, a friend of mine, Drew Johnson, goes into this in quite, in quite some depth. I'll just give you um, a, a kind of a short answer. I mean, I think we all as human beings uh, have rituals. You know, we, we, whether we like it or not, we do, we have ritualistic behaviors, we do ritual things. Part of the question of Leviticus, I think, is, is where are those rituals leading you to? So, I mean, if you're at the pub every night drinking seven pints, that's probably a ritual that's going to lead you to an early grave, right? Um, <clears throat> if you're uh, addicted to, you know, video games online or internet pornography, those are, those are rituals that you're, you're establishing in your life that are going to lead to destructive behaviors. Um, and so I think what Leviticus, I mean, I can't speak for the biblical authors, but I guess <clears throat> what Leviticus would s respond is to say, like, w what are the rituals that you perform? What do they mean? And how are they shaping you as a human being? And, and how is that forming your, your understanding of the world? Because again, you know, in modernism, I think, yeah, you're right. Like modernism has given us, has given us all sorts of rituals. But rituals, I think, 
largely without God, you know, largely based on human kind of human limitlessness, human, you know, the human capacity to to conquer new frontiers, to, you know, to find answers in science and our own ingenuity, um, which is, you know, again, which is the rituals that lead to not humility of our place within creation, but really lead to, I mean, I think, again, like, you know, like Han says, it's a, it's a narcissism, a narcissism and a, and a, and a trusting in our own powers, you know, that, that we, we don't need God, we can, we can do it on our own. So yeah, so I think, I think you're right, you're very right in saying that the world around us and modernism offers an alternative ritual life, it's just the question of, of where, where does that lead, you know. And thanks, Steve, that's a good question. Ian, did you want to answer, ask a question? Yeah, just very quickly, thank you. Um, you spoke about the context of Leviticus being a kind of rural society, and I was just interested in the actual practical way in which the content of the book would have been made available to those people, um, both before it was actually written down and after. Mm. So how did people get to know what was there? Yeah, I don't know what you feel like answering. <laughs> I think, <clears throat> I mean, I think probably... Most scholars would say that that you know that the teaching was would be done within the family, and so it was mostly would have to have been memorization. Um, you know that's why you have a nice kind of mnemonic with ten the ten commandments. You know you have ten fingers and ten toes, um, and I think it was probably primarily done in the home, and it would have been the. Um, the responsibility of the the kind of the father of, of the household um, to to teach and to instill these rituals, like Sabbath was obviously a particularly important one, and so it was up to the father and the mother, the patriarch and the matriarch, to enforce these rituals. Um, <clears throat> you know, one, one of the uh, little stories I tell in the book is. Um, is, is, you know, just trying to reimagine what it was like to, you know, because animals, by and large, in an ancient Israelite home, the animals lived on the ground, kind of the ground floor. So you would live with your, you know, with your sheep, your lambs, and, and whatnot. And, um, you know, imagine, you know, a father taking a son or maybe even a daughter, um, you know, up to, to the altar, to Jerusalem, and the child seeing you know, the life of this animal, you know, being poured out in this sacrificial way and understanding and making these connections between blood and atonement and the smells of the altar and, you know, the, the sight of flames rising up and, you know, all of these things. And I think that's where, that's where ritual just in a, in a kind of day-to-day -day type way, becomes so powerful. Um, so, <clears throat> so I think primarily it would have been through kind of memorization, singing of the psalms, probably you know, family singing together or singing in the fields or you know whatever it might be. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it's interesting. It's interesting to think you know when when historians talk about medieval Christianity, how they say that you know so much was taught because a lot of people didn't understand the Latin mass was taught through stained glass and the windows and the stories of the gospels. Um, so <clears throat> maybe like a medieval peasant, they might have known some of the you know some of the stories from the gospels and the general gist of it. Maybe maybe for the ancient Israelites, they kind of knew some of these stories about you know, Father Abraham and Moses and and whatnot, but but only got these little little bits. But that's a, that's a great question. Yeah. I'm going to use my privilege of holding the mic to ask uh, yeah. a question. And it, it's <laughs> actually right, might, for... This for, might be the last question, Peter, because we've got to get to um, our... This one's for um, Matthias. Um, so it's, it's a question basically about um, the relevance of Christ descending to the dead or descending into hell to the second goat in Leviticus 16. And I suppose the question is in two forms. One is does Bart use that to justify his position? And what do you think about that kind of parallel yourself? Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. um, yes, so, so Bart has a theology of the descent into hell, and in, in some way, 
I mean, I, I have to admit, you know, I, I read these, these small prints sections a long time ago, <laughs> and, I, um, and I don't know whether he makes reference to it in, uh, in, in direct connection to the Levitical text, uh, but, um, but within his wider systematic um, framework, you know, yes, I mean, he, he, that, that's exactly uh, that, that's exactly how you would kind of explain it, yeah. Um, and your second question was, or your kind of follow-up was, whether I would agree with, with, with that. Um, I, I, I wouldn't, um, but because I think the, the goat that is sent out to, into the realm of Asasel, um is, is that sin-laden animal that uh, represents being cut off from the, the, the holy place. And so, however, we have to understand the descent into Hades, you know, that uh, First Peter, I think, is right, talks about, that, that there's no, uh, the, the son is not cut off from the father. Um, Hans Urs von Balthasar has a very interesting theology of, of, of the, the three days and uh, Christ's descent. But again, I, I, I find that any theology that uh, is not Trinitarian or or splits the father and the son, I, I would find problematic, as you probably know from, from my paper on, <laughs> on, on the atonement. So, so I think that there is that, that, that symbolism that I wouldn't want to bring into, uh, into the synthesis in Jesus Christ as Bart does. I want to kind of leave it, you know, um, as, as, as two pictures, uh, highlighting two different faiths. Well, I think we'll stop there. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you. <clears throat>